Hi listeners, this is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Before we get into it, just a few quick announcements. If you think of yourself as part of the Effective Altruism community, you should fill out the 2018 Effective Altruism Survey. This helps keep track of who's involved, how they're trying to improve the world, and what they actually believe. I'll put a link in the show notes and associated blog post. Secondly, if you want to get a high-impact job, you should check out our job board, which was recently updated with new vacancies. You can find it at 80,000hours.org slash job hyphen board. It's where we list the jobs that we're most enthusiastic about filling, and I'll stick up a link to that in the show notes and the blog post as well. Finally, I just wanted to give a shout out to our producer, Kieran Harris, who's been doing a great job editing these episodes and generally helping to improve the show. And without further ado, I bring you Eva Vivaut. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Eva Vivaut. Eva is a lecturer in the Research School of Economics at the Australian National University and the founder of AidGrade, a research institute that pulls together hundreds of global development studies in order to provide actionable advice. Eva has a PhD in economics and an MA in mathematics from UC Berkeley, and an MPhil in development studies from Oxford University. She's also previously worked at the World Bank. She's a vegan, a Giving What We Can member, and principal investigator on Y Combinator Research's randomized controlled trial of a basic income. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Great to be here. (laughs) So Um, we're going to talk a bit about your career uh, as an economist and the various findings that you've had in your research over the last five years. Uh, But first, kind of what are your main research interests these days? Is there any way of summarizing it? Is is it kind of a, a core topic that you're looking into? So a lot of my work is uh, really on how to make better um, evidence-based policy decisions. And part of that that I've recently gotten into is looking more at priors um, that people may have, uh, both policymakers and researchers. And there's there's lots actually to say about priors, um, but I think that's a direction that my research has gone recently that actually relates quite well to some of the the previous stuff, uh, the linkage being evidence-based policy. (laughs) There's a lot of heavy material to cover there later in the show. But to warm up, let's talk first about Y Combinator's basic income study. What is that study looking at and what motivates it? Yeah, no, I'm really excited by this study. So essentially, the study is to give out $1,000 per month for either three or five years uh, to a bunch of individuals who are randomly selected. So the randomization is um, at this individual level. It's not actually like... Um, giving, for example, everybody in an area uh, the program. And uh, there's a control group as well that still gets some nominal amount to, you know, hopefully uh, so that they continue to answer surveys and such. Mm. And we're looking at a variety of outcomes. So things like time use, for example, um, like most economists would say that if you give people money, they should actually work a little bit less. So that's a completely irrational thing to do. But If they are working less, what are they doing with their time instead? Uh, Because, you know, it could be actually really good for people to work less if they are, for example, getting more education so they can get a better job in the future or taking care of their kids or et cetera, et cetera. Like there's all sorts of productive uses of time that one might find, um, you know, otherwise adding a lot of value. There's, you know, health outcomes, education outcomes. I should say this program is targeted to relatively poorer individuals and relatively younger individuals because the thought is that it could actually, you know, change people's trajectory over time. So, yeah, those are kind of the areas where we might expect the money to go a bit farther and to see slightly larger effects. Interesting. Okay. So, given that it's uh, from Y Combinator, which is uh, a tech a tech startup accelerator, is it kind of motivated by the concern that everyone's going to lose their jobs because of technology, or is it just more, uh-huh. more, more prosaic issues around equality? Uh, you know, yeah, equality and lack of opportunity in, in the United States. Um, I think there's a variety of um, motivations here. So I think in the background somewhere there is this concern about technology uh, potentially displacing workers. I think, you know, there's also some genuine, you know, utopian ideal of, you know, people (laughs) should be able to do, you know. They shouldn't um, have to be wage slaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not like all negative people lose their jobs. It's people, you know, could lose jobs in a good way. (laughs) Nobody actually wants, you know, hard work in some regards. I mean, to be fair, it's not like really a great test of what happens if, you know, people lose jobs per se, because 
you know, to do that, what you would want is a randomized controlled trial in which you fire people, <laughs> um, which is not likely to happen anytime it's soon. Not going to get past the ethics board. <laughs> yeah, but I think this is more motivated by the idea that, you know, you can imagine some worlds in which what you would want to do is expand the social safety net. And if you are expanding the social safety net, this could be one relatively efficient way of doing so. And so let's look at, you know, what the effects of this particular kind of program would be. Yeah. And you might imagine that some kind of program like this would probably start out start out with targeting relatively poor individuals, even though like a true basic income program would, you know, target everybody. Mm. Uh, so what what do you expect to find uh, given past studies that are that are similar? And also, how many people are in the study? Yeah, so we have uh, about a thousand people in the treatment group, two thousand control, and then this larger like super control group for which we just have administrative data. Mm. And it's actually a decent sized experiment. And there have not been so the most similar studies in the states are some of the um, negative income tax experiments um, and EITC, like from the 70s. Um, there's also, I guess, um, the Alaska Permanent Fund and the other similar ones, I would say, would be moving to opportunities and the Oregon uh, health insurance experiment. Mm. But these are all like, I mean, they've all got quite a lot of differences, actually. So Alaska Permanent Fund, everybody just gets you know, a certain transfer. So that one actually is universal. Um, it's not very much of a transfer. And you've got to use different approaches to evaluate it since everybody gets it. Oregon health insurance, well, obviously that's health insurance. <laughs> um, negative income tax experiments, those were quite old and um, had a lot of differential attrition issues. Like I say, like by now, I think most economists would expect um, some effects on labor supply. Um, there, there's loads of papers on labor supply elasticity. So I think there's a little bit less on what people do with their time mm. otherwise. So like one thing we're doing is designing this custom uh, time use app that uh, people can put on their phone so we can, you know, sort of ping them and ask, hey, what are you doing right now? Is there a key uncertainty that it's trying to resolve? Like, you know, will people quit their jobs or will they become happier or, you know, will they spend more time on leisure with their family, that, that kind of thing? Yeah. So, I mean, rather than like one key outcome, we've got like lots of different families of outcomes. So we've got health outcomes, we've got education outcomes, we've got financial health, we've got, you know, subjective well-being, we've got this kind of employment, time use, income stuff. So, you know, uh, we've actually even got some more behavioral things like political outcomes, like, you know, do people have got more or less intergroup prejudice and like, you know, other regarding preferences, that kind of thing. So we've got actually quite a lot of things. Also, th some things relating to the work on uh, scarcity that, you know, people under a lot of um, economic pressure might make worse decisions. Um, well, is that like a short term effect, long term effect, you know, like that kind of thing? So there's actually quite a lot of outcomes. And, you know, sometimes when I talk to people about it, they get a little bit confused. We're looking at so many different things. Um, but I think for a study of uh, this kind of cost, yeah. it's actually really good to get a lot of different uh, outcomes from I, it. I just did, quickly did the maths and it looks like it should cost something like $100 million. Uh, not quite, but still quite high up there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, I was just thinking, if so, if you've got a thousand and you're giving them twelve thousand dollars each, that'll come to twelve million each year of the study, plus then the control group and all the other on costs and so on. So I guess it depends how long you run it, but it's pretty yeah. serious expense. I, I guess do, do you worry about having kind of too many outcome variables, or I suppose you'll be smart enough to to adjust for the multiple testing problem? <laughs> yeah, so we're adjusting for that, and. Uh... Yeah, I mean, so we're basically within a type of thing. So like health, we'll, we'll consider these as sort of like separate subject areas. So, you know, there'll be like a paper on health, a paper on, you know, financial health, etc. And then within each of those papers, we'll do all the um, appropriate, you know, family wise error corrections, etc. Yeah. Um, are you going to pre-register the analysis, do you think? Yes, we will. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> That's great. Um, so, so what's your role in the whole thing? There's, there's quite a significant number of people involved, right? Yeah, no, this is a great project. So for the PIs, it's uh, myself and Elizabeth Rhodes, um, who's a recent uh, PhD grad from Michigan. David Brockman, who's a Stanford GSB 
um, assistant professor and Sarah Miller, who's a um, health economist at the Business School at Michigan. Mm-hmm. And so those are um, the PIs. And then we've got like a larger advisory board. We're trying to, you know, keep in touch with uh, both relevant academics, you know, a bunch of senior researchers, as well as you know, people obviously who are involved in other similar projects like we try to continue to talk with. And what's what's your niche? Well, I'm just one of the PIs. So, okay. I mean, you know, just <laughs> with quote marks. Um, uh, I think I was originally brought on board uh, partially for, you know, experience mm. with um, impact evaluations and uh, sort of these, you know, large scale trials. Yeah. So uh, when, when might we hope to see results from it? This will be, it'll be some years out. Yeah, it will. So, like I say, like the shortest treatment arm, that's uh, three years out. But um, actually, we'd be uh, gathering data slightly before the very end of it, because what we don't want to do is, you know, do a survey at the end of the three years, and then we get the effect of people coming off the program, you know, rather Mm. than, uh, you know, that kind of transition effect. So we've got a baseline survey, midline survey, and endline survey. And we've got a bunch of little intermediate surveys along the way that people can do just quickly by themselves on mobile. And for the big surveys, we're going to do the last of those like two and a half years in or so. And even if we get like some early results, we're not going to release the bulk of things until, you know, at least the end of that three-year arm because things can always change and we don't because it's a very high profile study what we don't want is you know people to come away with some idea of how things went like a year in and then you know three years in (laughs) things have changed a lot but people nobody listens to it and it could also like affect some of the narrative like we don't want the subjects to hear about themselves in the media right (laughs) that would not be great (laughs) yeah that would be uh disastrous really Another exciting thing you're working on outside of your core research agenda is how to get people to accept clean meat, which we've uh, recently done a few episodes on. Um, I think that paper is called Effective Strategies for Overcoming the Naturalistic Heuristic, Experimental Evidence on Consumer Acceptance of Clean Meat. Um, What did you look at in that study? Yeah, so we were interested in a few things. So we were interested in looking at... so. Okay, I assume you've covered clean meat. Clean meat is just essentially, you know, uh, you can think of it as lab-grown meat or synthetic meat or some other kind of unpalatable terms, if it's, you like. It's the but rebranding it's of that. <laughs> yeah, it's the rebranding of that. Um, so, you know, meat not from animals uh, directly. And some people have got a sort of knee-jerk reaction that, ew, this is disgusting. It's, you know not um, natural. And so this is what we're calling sort of like this naturalistic heuristic um, that sort of prevents people from being interested in clean meat. And we were looking at ways of overcoming that. So um, we tried various methods, um, like directly saying, look, things that are natural aren't necessarily good and vice versa. We tried another appeal that was more trying to get them to think about things that they are quite happy with, even though they are unnatural. And so maybe, you know, prompt some cognitive dissonance there. Like if they don't like clean meat, they should also not like a lot of other things that they do like. Um, Vaccines. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there's lots of foods that, you know, something has happened to them, like they're fermented or, Mm. you know, they just change a lot since from the past anyways, like corn nowadays looks nothing like corn a long time ago. Chickens nowadays look nothing like chickens a long time ago, etc. And we also looked at, you know, giving people sort of a descriptive norms type of approach of, you know, other people are very excited about clean meat. So, you know, maybe you should be too. Mm. Um, and it's a little bit tentative, but it seemed like the uh, approach that was sort of trying to prompt cognitive dissonance by telling them about how, you know, there's all these other unnatural goods that they liked was maybe doing the best. The downside, though, is it did seem like quite a lot of indiv- like more people than I would have thought were actually quite negative towards clean meat. Um, and especially like almost nothing did as well as we had one treatment where we just sort of we didn't know how a priori how poorly people would respond to it. So we thought we're going to prime some people with negative social information so that at least there's some people for whom, you know, they've got some kind of anti, you know, they've got some kind of naturalistic. Some prejudice against it. Mm. Yeah, exactly. So 
Uh, and it turned out like that priming effect was pretty much bigger than anything else we found, oh, no. which was kind of disappointing because you can imagine that the very first thing that other companies who produce, you know, conventional meat products will do most likely is to, you know, try to attack clean meat as like, Gross. you know, some... Yeah, so that was a little bit unfortunate. And we also did another study where we were looking at the effects of uh, knowing about clean meat on ethical beliefs because we thought, well, actually, um, if the, um, you know, to some extent, your ethical beliefs could be a function of what you think is like fairly easy to do. And so if you think that there is a good alternative out there, it could actually potentially change your views towards animals more generally Mm. um, or the environment. So we are using this you know, negative priming as an instrument for people thinking, you know, more or less positively towards clean meat and then uh, looking at the effect on ethical beliefs. And there was actually some evidence that people were changing, you know, at least their stated ethical beliefs. Um, I think we need to do a few more robustness checks there, but it was, um, yeah, still quite surprising. Yeah. So uh, why do you think the embrace unnaturalness message uh, worked the best? Do you have a theory there? Um, my best guess is that it had something to do with, you know, um, cognitive dissonance and the fact that it was, you know, a relatively mild way of putting things. People don't tend to like fairly strong messages against what they hold dear, you know, so we weren't really undermining or trying to undermine what they were valuing. We were just saying, look, even by your own <laughs> judgments here, mm. to be consistent with yeah. you know, the own things you're before. right about these other things so why not be right about <laughs> like, this one too exactly. you're so smart <laughs> <laughs> it's a very positive message in a way yeah, yeah. How, how clear cut was the result? Are you pretty confident that that was the, the best one? You know, I'm not 100% confident. So this is why I don't want to oversell it because one could say, well, you know, this one was the one that sort of lasted the longest. We had like some follow ups, but at least in the short run, you know, it could have also been uh, the uh, uh, descriptive norms one uh, might have done pretty well as well. So like, you know, it depends on whether you think um, you know, how we should weight the different rounds of data that we collected, right? And so we, yes. we kind of pre-specified we were interested in the follow-up. But if you weren't interested in that, if you thought that, you know, actually the early data should be somewhat informative about the later data and maybe the later data was just a bad draw, for example, then, you know, uh, so I wouldn't like lean too, too hard on it. Yeah. I mean, I think that the naturalness heuristic is one of the most consistently harmful <laughs> heuristics that people apply because it causes them to, in my view, at least reach the wrong answer just about so many different issues. And I wonder if there's the potential to just have a nonprofit that just like pursues relentlessly this, <laughs> this point that being unnatural is not bad. <laughs> being natural is not good. <laughs> and, and it would help with clean meat, but also just so many other things as well. That's a fair point. And I mean, while doing this, we got introduced to so many people who are doing so much interesting work on like, you know, vaccines, etc. cetera, that, mm. um, you know, yeah, I think that especially in the future as like biotech in general becomes better, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's going to be so many new products that are, you know, yeah. unnatural that could we, plausibly benefit from such a, such a message. Yeah, we, we just need a generic pro-unnaturalness organization that can, can kind of be vigilantes <laughs> and go to whatever new unnatural thing people don't like. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, well, it sounds like, uh, I mean, clean meat is just kind of being developed now so there's probably going to be we'll want to try a a whole lot uh, of of other messages because you've only tried out three here uh well were there any other messages that you considered including that that you'd like to see other people test Hmm, that's a good question you know things don't come to mind at this moment but i do think there's a lot more room for further research here especially one thing i don't know about i'm imagining that people are using unnaturalness they, they seem to also think, well, it's unnatural and therefore it's not healthy and therefore it's, you know, all this other stuff. But I think, yeah, there could be more done to break that down a little bit more because presumably you could, in fact, at least theoretically think that something is unnatural without thinking it's necessarily, you know, unhealthy. unhealthy. Mm. Um, yeah. So you've written a paper that's been pretty widely cited in the last few years called How Much Can We Generalize from Impact Evaluations? That, that was your job market paper, right? Yep. So that's the work that you did during a PhD that you're, that you're using to try to get a job, which, which we might talk about later. But kind of what question were you, were you trying to answer with this paper? Yeah. So at the time that I was writing it, there was uh, quite a lot of impact evaluations being done on various topics like deworming, bed nets, etc. 
but not so much of an effort to synthesize all the results. And uh, so I'd started this uh, nonprofit research institute, 8th grade, to gather all of the results from various impact evaluations and try to say something more systematic about uh, them. But uh, in the course of doing so, I was kind of um, shocked to see how much results really varied. And mm. I think if you talk to researchers, they'll say, oh, yeah, well, we know that things vary. Of course, they vary. There's obviously all these sources of heterogeneity. But I think, you know, the language people use when talking to the general public or to funders is actually quite a bit different. Um, <laughs> and uh, there, you know, things get really simplified. So I think there's a bit of a disconnect. And anyways, I was investigating a little bit some of the potential sources of heterogeneity. I mean, it was um, at that point, when I'm looking at it, it's actually observational data, even if the data are coming from RCTs, because I'm just looking at, you know, the results of the various papers found. Uh, so there, you know, I can't definitively say, you know, the sources of the heterogeneity, but I could at least look for correlates of that and also try to say something about how in a way we should be thinking about generalized ability and how there are some metrics that we can use that can help us you know, estimate the generalized ability of our own results. So basically you're trying to figure out if we have a study uh, in a particular place and time that has an outcome, how much can we say that that result will apply to other places and times that this same question could be studied? Is that, is that one way of putting it? Yeah, because you'll never actually have exactly the same setting ever again. Like, even if you do it in the same place, uh, things hopefully would have changed from the first time you did it. So, you know, we might naturally sort of expect to have different results. And then the issue is, um, you know, well, by how much and mm. how can we know that? All right. So I'm the kind of guy who, when they load up a paper, kind of skips the method section, just skips straight to the results. So how much can we generalize from studies in, in development economics? Not terribly much, I'm afraid to say. This was really disheartening to me um, at the time. Gone over it a bit, but um, yeah, I guess one main takeaway as well is that we should probably be paying a little bit more attention to um, sampling variance in terms of thinking of the results of study. So sampling variance is just the kind of random noise that you get, um, especially when you've got very small studies and some small studies just happen to find larger results. Um, so, you know, I think if we try to separate that out a bit and, you know, a little bit downweight to those results that uh, are coming from studies with small sample sizes, that certainly helps a bit. Another thing that came out, and this is just, you know, sort of an observational correlation, but one of the more interesting ones, and I think it's now part of the part of the dialogue you hear from people, is that results from smaller studies that were done um, with an NGO, potentially as like a pilot before government scale up, those ones were initially more promising. And then the scale ups kind of didn't live up to the hype, as it were, um, like the government implemented larger versions of the same programs, or, you know, similar programs, they didn't seem to do so well. So that's a little bit disconcerting if we think that generally we start as researchers by studying these interventions in smaller situations in the hopes that when we scale it up, we'll find the same effects. Mm. So is, is the issue there that NGOs do these pilot studies and for those pilot studies, they're a bit smaller and the people who are running them are very passionate about it. So they run them to a very high standard or they, they, they offer the intervention to a very high standard. But then when it's scaled up, the people who are doing it, you know, they don't have as much money or they don't know what they're doing. And so the, the results tend to be much worse. Yeah, I think that's part of it. I mean, there could also be like uh, a targeting aspect of this. Like, you know, you start with the places where you think there's going to be particularly high effects. And then as you scale it up, you might end up, you know, incorporating, you know, expanding the treatment into some people who actually are not going to benefit as much. And that would be actually completely fine. I think the worst story is where, yeah, the initial NGO or the initial study, everybody was very excited about it and putting a lot of effort into it. And then maybe their capacity constraints are similar when it was tried to be scaled up. So that's a little bit more disconcerting, I guess. Right. So let's just back up a little bit. You said the answer is that we can't generalize very much from these development studies. What is your measure of generalizability statistically? And, uh, you know, on, on a scale on, between like zero and one, kind of where do we stand? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Uh, one of the things I argue for in my paper is that we should be caring about this uh, true interstudy variance term, which I and some other people like uh, Andrew Gelman call tau squared, which uh, one has to estimate. You don't sort of know that up front, but that this is a pretty good measure of, well, the true, <laughs> the true interstudy variance. 
and there's also a related uh, figure that that ties into, which is called the I squared, where you've got essentially the proportion of the variance that's not just sampling error. And that's nice because it's sort of a units list metric that's well established in the meta meta analysis literature. And it kind of ranges from zero to one. And it's very much related to this pooling factor where if you're trying to think about how much to weight a certain study, um, you might think of putting some weight on that study and some weight on actually all the other studies in that area. And if you're doing that, you know, there's some weight that you can put on one individual study's result and uh, that would range between, you know, zero and one. Um, And, you know, similarly for uh, the weight you put on all the other studies results. I'm not sure if that completely answered your question, but, you know, there (laughs) are these metrics that you can use. and I would completely agree. And I was, you know, trying to push for initially and um, that, I mean, I'm still trying to push for, but I think it's now more accepted that we should be thinking of generalizability as something that's non-binary that lies, Mm. you know, somewhere between zero and one. Yeah. So what is tau squared? Uh, I saw this in the paper, but to be honest, I didn't really (laughs) understand what it it actually is. Is this kind of some some partition of of the variance that's due to, uh, well, yeah, I I just don't know. (laughs) Yeah, no worries. So essentially, yeah, you can think of it as some measure of, um, so, okay, you've got a whole bunch of different results from different studies. Some of that variation is just due to uh, sampling variance. So, like, you c- if you think of these studies as all replications, mm. um, I mean, they're not, but if you were to think of them as replications, then the only source of variance would be the sampling variance because, you know, you'd be drawing an observation from uh, some distribution and you'd be drawing a slightly different observation, so you'd get a little bit of noise there naturally. So, so, so that's, that's just the idea that, you know, some studies get kind of lucky and some studies get kind of unlucky in a sense, and so they have higher or lower numbers just because of what individuals they happen to include. Yeah, exactly. And so, like, if you're then thinking, okay, well, let's, we're not actually really in a case of replications. We're actually in a case where there's a different effect size in every place that we do the study because there's so much heterogeneity, like there's other contextual factors or mm. whatnot. Well, then you've got not just this sampling variance, but also some additional sort of true mm. latent heterogeneity the, that you need to estimate. The, the effect yeah. was different in the different cases. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, I'm just arguing f- for separating the two of these things out mm. um, and then trying to say, okay, well, this is the, you know, true heterogeneity. And you could go even a step further and say, well, look, maybe we can model some of the variation. And maybe we want to think that, you know, the important thing um, in terms of generalizing is how much unmodeled heterogeneity Uh, there is, like how much we can't explain. Like if we can uh, say that, for example, well, I've got a conditional cash transfer program and I want to know the effects on enrollment rates. And maybe I think baseline enrollment rates are really important um, in determining that because it's probably easier to do a better job improving enrollment rates from like, I don't know, 75% than from 99%, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's just a little bit easier. Mm. So, you know, you can say, okay, well, then I've got some model where baseline enrollment rates are an input into that model. Um, And then, you know, after accounting for baseline enrollment rates, what sort of the residual unexplained heterogeneity in results, because that's going to be the kind of limiting factor on how much I can actually extrapolate from one uh, setting to another Mm. accurately. (laughs) Okay, so uh, a tau squared of one would indicate that all of them had the same effect in every in every case that they were implemented, and a zero would indicate that it was totally random, the effect uh, that it would have in each different circumstance. Is that right? Uh, Not quite, actually. Um, Sorry, I might have explained this a little bit funny, because uh, so there is something that ranges between uh, zero and one, which is um, either the I squared or this um, pooling uh, term. But the tau squared itself Since you can think of it as a kind of variance, Mm -hmm. um, it's going to really be in terms of the units of whatever the thing was initially. So like um, if it's, you know, conditional cash transfers on enrollment rates, well, enrollment rates are maybe in percentage points. So then, you know, the variance would relate to those units of enrollment rates. And so that's actually a great point because it's going to be very difficult to compare the tau squared of one particular outcome to the mm. tau squared of, you know, a particular of a completely different intervention's effect on a completely different outcome because, you know, those things are just going to be in different units entirely. That's one advantage of the I squared relative to tau uh, squared is okay. that the I squared is unitless. It kind of scales things. So that does run between zero and one and does not depend on the units. Although 
you know, it's not 100% straightforward either. I mean, that has also got some drawbacks. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to summarize the paper here, but I guess mm. if one's really super interested in these issues, <laughs> I would just recommend read the paper. Yeah, look at it. <laughs> it goes uh, in much greater detail. I'm, I'm simplifying a bit here. Sure. Okay. Well, uh, well, we'll definitely stick up a link to it. So let's say that we had a new intervention that no one really knew anything about. And then one trial was done of it in a particular place, and it found that it improved the outcome by one standard deviation. Given your findings, like how how should we expect it to perform in a in a different in, in a different situation? Presumably less than one st- standard deviation improvement, right? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, one standard deviation improvement would be just. huge, <laughs> <laughs> enormous. Um, I was just saying that because one's a nice round number, but oh yeah, yeah. well I guess that, like, but the typical intervention is going to be more like point one rather than okay. one. So like if I saw one somewhere, I'd be like, wow, <laughs> that's got to be like a real outlier. That was a very high draw. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So I would be skeptical just for that reason. Okay, so so, so I got point one. Uh, in okay, how, what might you expect then uh, if it was done somewhere else? Well, it's going to depend a lot on the intervention and the outcome. Mm. And if I'm, you know, using some more complicated model, I think the best way to answer those questions is to look at a specific intervention and a specific outcome and to try to model as much of the heterogeneity as possible. Mm. And there's not going to be any substitute for that, really. What I'm looking at in my paper is trying to say something like, well, yeah, that, that might be so, but still, what can we say about, you know, looking across all the interventions, across all the outcomes? And that's where I pick up patterns like, you know, if it's done by an NGO, if it's a relatively smaller mm. program, it tends to have higher effects. But I mean, that's a little bit hand wavy. I think the best way to answer those questions in terms of like, what do I really find is to, you know, go to that particular intervention, that particular outcome. But what I can say is that even with one study's results, and now this is pretty weak, but Hmm. it's still true, uh, still a relationship, is that if you look at the heterogeneity of results within study, that actually does predict the heterogeneity of results across studies. Hmm. Um, I mean, you know, weakly, and there's no reason for it to necessarily be true, but it is a stylized fact that one could use. Hey, I just wanted to interject that I later emailed Eva to see if there was any rule of thumb we could use to get a sense of how bad the generalizability is from one study to another. One option would be to say that the median absolute amount by which a predicted effect size differs from the true value given in the next study is 99%. And in standardized values, the average absolute value of the error is 0.18 standard deviations compared to an average effect size of 0.12 standard deviations. So colloquially, uh, if you say that your prediction of the outcome of a study would be X, then it could very easily be zero or two X. That's how badly the estimates will be off on average. In fact, it's as likely to be outside the range of between zero and two X as inside it. That figure wouldn't be rigorous enough to satisfy an expert working in this field, but it's good enough for us here. So back to the interview. So yeah, did you find out under what circumstances results are more generalizable and and when they're less generalizable? Yeah, so again, this is a little bit hand wavy and I I think a little bit less the point of the paper, because like I say, like, even though these studies are mostly RCTs, when I'm looking at them, at that point, it's as though I've got observational data because mm. the studies are selected in various ways and mm. that, you know, so, you know, where people even choose to do the studies is selected and I'm just looking at this data. But despite that, if you just sort of do the sort of, you know, naive thing of doing ordinarily scores regression of your <laughs> effect sizes on various study characteristics. Uh, so I mentioned like bigger programs and government implemented programs tend to do worse. Mm. There's not much of a general trend in other things, like in particular, like it doesn't seem to matter so much if it's an RCT or not, or where it was done. Actually, one thing I did find is you can't even necessarily just say, well, so often you hear from policymakers and, and researchers, well, we've got results from one particular country. So at least we know where it wor- how it works in that country. And actually, I would disagree with that. Um, <laughs> because even within a country, if you've got multiple results from the same country, um, they don't predict each other very well. And it, it kind of makes sense if you think about, 
you know, I don't think anybody would say within the U.S., oh, yeah, well, results from Massachusetts are going to be very similar to results from Texas or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, like, even within a country, there's so much variation that, I mean, maybe it's better than taking results from a completely different area of the globe, but it's still Mm -hmm. not that great. And I can't actually even find any kind of statistically significant relationship, (laughs) um, you know, uh, within a country. So isn't this pretty damning? Why would we bother to do these studies if they don't generalize to other situations? It seems like we can't learn very much from them. Yeah, so that's the great uh, devil advocates type question. I guess, you know, I'm still, despite all this, an optimist that we're learning something, right? Because part of it is that this way of looking at it doesn't model all the little factors. I mean, I am actually quite skeptical of most of the stories that people tell about Mm. why an intervention worked in one place and why it didn't work in another place, because I think a lot of those stories are constructed after the fact. Mm. And, you know, they're just sort of just so stories that I don't think are very credible. But that said, I don't want to say that we can learn nothing. I would just say that it's very, very hard (laughs) to learn things. But, you know, what's the alternative? (laughs) Well, I guess potentially using one's intuition, but I mean, one, one, one thing that you could say looking at this is that it's not really worth running these studies. An alternative view would be that because each study is less informative than we thought, we have to run even more of them. Uh, do, do you have a view between those two different ways of uh, responding? Yeah, I mean, I would argue for running more of them, but um, I mean, not in a completely senseless manner. I mean, I think we can still say something about there are ones which are higher variants where we Uh, could learn more where the value of information of doing another study is going to be higher. Mm. So I guess part of this depends on, sorry to get into, you know, technical details, but like the decision, the decision problem you think people are faced with, right? Mm. Because if you think that a policymaker is, you know, what they really care about in making their decision is whether some result is statistically significant and better than some other result um, in a statistically significant way. Well, okay, then that's a different problem from if they are uh, just trying to find, you know, if they're okay with something that, you know, uh, there's a 20% chance works better than the alternative. So think of this all in terms of like, there is some problem that a policymaker is trying to solve. um, And then within that problem, you've got the ability to run studies or not run studies. And the Mm -hmm. value of information of running each of those things is going to be different depending on, well, how much, you know, underlying heterogeneity there. So just to be a little bit uh, simpler about this, you know, the intuition is that if you've got I mean, the studies that are the most valuable to run would be the ones where you don't know very well a priori what's going to happen. Mm. You've got, uh, you know, high degree of uncertainty uh, up front, but where you think there's like a good upswing potential, as it were, right? Like mm. it could overtake the best possible outcome. So a lot of value of information. I think is the, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, we'll come back to, to some of those issues later because you have other papers that kind of deal with how these RCTs can inform policymakers. But let's just talk a little bit more about your method here. So how did you collect all of this data on all these different RCTs? It sounds like an, an, an enormous hassle. Huh. Yeah, <laughs> um, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, obviously one has to do it, but oh my goodness. Um, no, I think... No, I was very lucky actually to have a lot of great help from various RAs over, you know, the course of several years through eighth grade um, who were, you know, gathering and double checking and, you know, sometimes triple checking some of this data. Everything, uh, all the data was gathered by two people. Um, and if their uh, results um, disagreed in some way and the, their inputs disagreed, then a third person would, you know, come in and arbitrate. So, that's how we got sort of all of the characteristics of the different studies coded up, um, all of the effect sizes. I am hopeful that in the future we're going to be doing be able to do a lot more with like automated reading of these papers. You would think that's absolutely crazy, but I think it works pretty well so far. I mean, not of the actual results tables. I think the results tables are sort of the hardest ask in a way because Mm. like you need to really know like what a particular result represents. Like is this a regression with controls? Is it with whatever else? Like what methods, etc. But like for basic characteristics of studies, like where was it done? Was it an RCT or not? Mm. Um, Those kinds of things. Actually, we've had pretty good success with some pilot uh, studies trying to you know, read that 
automatically through natural language processing. And mm. that I think is really like the best hope for the future because studies are coming out so quickly these days that mm. I think to keep abreast of like all of the literature and all the various topics, I mean, it's even more of a constraint for the medical literature where there's loads of studies and yeah. new ones coming out all the time. Um, you know, meta-analyses can go out of date quite quickly and they're not really incentivized properly in the research community. So, you know, the only way to get people to actually do them and keep the evidence up to date in some sense is by at least making the process easier. I don't think that it can be ever 100% done by computer. I think you're still going to need some inputs from people. But if you can, you know, reduce the amount of effort it takes by like 80% or 90% and mm -hmm. just, you know, have people focus on the harder questions and the harder parts of that, that would be a huge benefit. So, Do you think there's enough of this data aggregation uh, or are there kind of too few incentives for people to do this in, in academia? No, I think the incentives are all wrong because researchers, they want to do the first paper on a subject mm. or, you know, ideally, this, if not the first, then the second, um, you know, the third is even worse than that. And by the time you get to do a meta-analysis, well, I mean, that's kind of, you know, the bottom of the bin in some regards. You would think it would be more highly valued, but it's not. Well, would, um, wouldn't you get a lot of citations from that? Because people would trust the results from a meta-analysis more than each of the individual papers. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. And you can get some fairly well cited uh, meta analyses. Unfortunately, like citations are just not the uh, criterion that's really used uh, for evaluating research in economics. I know it is more so in other fields, but not so much in economics, where it really is the journal that matters. Uh, so, so, so the journals that publish that kind of thing just aren't viewed as the most prestigious? Yeah, that's exactly mm. right. I mean, I've, yeah. I've also heard that in fields where kind of collecting a big data set, especially a historical data set, is what enables you to ask a lot uh, of new questions. There's perhaps too few incentives to put it together because if you, you do all of the work of putting it together, then you publish one paper about it and then other people will um, use the same data set to publish lots of papers themselves. And in a sense, like you don't get the full fruit of all of the initial work that you did. Is that, is that a possibility here where other people can now access this data set of all of these different RCTs that you've compiled? And so you don't, you don't, kind of, they drink a bit of your milkshake in a sense. <laughs> um, I mean, I wouldn't put it that strongly. Um, uh, both because actually I'm quite happy if other people do things with the data <laughs> and also because, I mean, it depends, I guess, where you are at in the process. Like, I think for people who are, um, just finishing up their PhD, for example, it's actually very good to show that you can compile a very large data set because that's mm. what a lot of, you know, a lot of research depends on having really good data. And if you can show that you can collect really good data, then that's great for you. Obviously, you also want to publish well based on that. But that's, I guess, a separate question. So what are the biggest weaknesses of, of this study? Do, do you think that we should trust this result, that results aren't that generalizable? Or, 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 is, or is this something that could be overturned uh, in, with future research? Oh, well, I don't think it's really a, a danger of being overturned per se. I think that, you know, um, that's just sort of a function of the fact we're doing social science and it's not, I mean, there are all sorts of things that, you know, can change and, and that matter for your treatment effects. So... Yeah, I, I'm not tremendously concerned about that. So what kinds of studies did you include uh, in this particular data set? For example, you, you were looking at development studies. Um, yeah. If, if you looked instead at, say, uh, you know, education studies in, in the developed world, you know, might you get a different result if you were kind of looking at a different domain or field? Uh, maybe. I think the bigger difference, though, would probably be with things that are less, at least intuitively context-specific, right? So like things like... Um, health. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like, so for example, in our data, actually, the things that almost varied more were the health interventions, but that's because we weren't controlling for things like baseline incidence of disease or any of those kinds of things. Right. Um, and if you do control for those, then, I mean, you know, we weren't doing that in the general analysis, but if you do control for them, then actually the heterogeneity is a lot smaller. So, you know, things that have a clearer, um, more straightforward causal effect, I would say, you know, there we might expect to see slightly different results. Hmm. So kind of antibiotics will usually treat the same disease anywhere. But but I suppose in these studies, they actually have different impacts because in different places, people have the underlying disease at different levels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, everybody, I think at this point would ag agree that, you know, things like, you know, deworming, etc. depend on what the baseline prevalence of the worms or whatever is. And, you know, once you control for those things, then you actually, because there's some very clear mechanism through which these things work, 
there, there are fewer things that can go wrong. Whereas like a, a more like general social science type thing, mm. there's so many factors that feed into what the treatment effects ultimately are. Mm. Uh, so it's a little bit messier. So you wrote another paper called uh, How Much Can Impact Evaluations Inform Policy Decisions, which I imagine was partly informed by, by this other paper. Uh, do, <laughs> do you want to explain what, what you found there? Sure. Um, so that paper is looking a bit at, well, the fact that if we do try to put this into some kind of framework where a policymaker is deciding between different options, and they're always going to want to choose the thing that has the highest effect. Well, you know, given the heterogeneity we observe, how often would they actually change their mind? Mm. Um, you know, if the outside option takes some particular uh, value. So, yeah, it's quite related. We also tried to use some priors that we had collected, uh, some predictions that policymakers had made about the effects of a particular program. So, so just to see if I've understood the setup correctly, you kind of you've got this modeled agent, which I guess is a politician or a bureaucrat or something, and they they've got some background thing that they could spend money on. Perhaps it's just like spending more money on schools or whatever else. And that's and, and they think that they know how good that is. And so that's something where they could stick the money. And then you're thinking of the value of a study on another thing that might be better or might be worse. And the the, the bureaucrats say, has, has even though there hasn't been any studies done yet, or, or not many, they have some belief about how good this other option is, um, this, this new option, but they're not sure about it, and so and they would and they would somewhat change their mind if a randomized control trial were done. And then you want to see, well, how often would that trial cause them to actually change their decision and go and go for this alternative option? Yeah, that's exactly it. You're putting it much better than I did. <laughs> so, I mean, what what did you find? Is there any way of communicating how often people do change their mind, and like what's perhaps what's the monetary value of these studies? That's an excellent question. So we didn't actually connect it to um, actual monetary value um, because that depends a bit on what you think sort of the value of some of these outcomes is. Like, um, you know, we kind of did this a little bit abstractly trying to compare two programs that, you know, one was 90% of the value of another one or, you know, 50%. But, you know, we weren't actually making assumptions at the sort of final, you know, the last mile type uh, part of, well, yeah, but what is this actually worth? Um, I mean, that's going to depend a bit on like what the actual, you know, outcomes and the values of the outcomes are. So I wish I had a better answer is what mm. I'm trying to say. Um, <laughs> okay, so in the, in the abstract you wrote, uh, we show that the marginal benefits of a study quickly fall and when a study will be the most useful in making a decision in a particular context is also when it will have the lowest external validity, which is a bit counterintuitive. And, and, and then also the results highlight that leveraging the wisdom of the crowds can result in greater improvements in policy outcomes than running an additional study. Do you want to explain those, those sentences? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I think one of the interesting things is, yeah, the statement that, well, when a study will be most useful is when it will have the lowest external validity. That is relating to the point that, you know, in a sense, when's the study going to be the most useful? What's well, going to be the most useful when it surprises us and was really different? Hmm. Um, when's it going to be the most different? Well, <laughs> when we're not going to be able to generalize more from it, when it's, you know, got some underlying factors that make it a little bit weird in some way it's going to be the highest value sort of in that setting but if you try to think about you know extrapolating from it is it not so much that that study can't be generalized to other things that makes it valuable but rather that other things can't already be generalized to this one so this is a more unique case yeah and i mean it could go either way in the sense that if you think that you know the other studies haven't found uh, this particular thing and this particular thing is a bit unique well you know likewise you wouldn't expect this unique thing to say much about those other ones either. So again, this is a little bit abstract because you can try to think about, well, yes, but does this new thing tell us something about, you know, some other more complicated underlying model of the world as to why this one happened to be so, you know, surprising. Uh, but yeah, this is general intuition. And then with respect to leveraging wisdom of the crowds, well, uh, we did look at different kinds of ways of making decisions. We looked at sort of a uh, dictator making a decision all by themselves versus, you know, a collective of various bureaucrats voting and just using a majority voting rule um, to try to decide which particular intervention to do. And there, because people can frequently be wrong, actually, you know, adding additional people to uh, the set of people who are making the decision can lead to substantial benefits in terms of the actual, in choosing the right 
program afterwards. There were at least some simulations in which it performed better. Are you saying that running these broad surveys is potentially more informative than an RCT and I guess also presumably cheaper as well, or at least in the model? Yeah, so I, I guess, so in the model, it's more a matter of like how many people are making the, the, the decision and uh, are the, how many people's inputs are being fed into this process. So mm-hmm. I guess if you've got a more democratic decision-making process or you involve more people, you know, their priors are more likely to be correct in that case, sort of mm-hmm. like their aggregate prior. And, you know, the benefits of just doing that can be higher uh, than the benefits of doing an RCT. I mean, it depends a little bit on, you know, all sorts of underlying parameters here, but there were at least some simulations for which that was definitely true, where adding additional people helping to make the decision uh, resulted in better decisions than uh, running an additional study. So what surprised you the most from these simulations that that you were running? Was there there anything that you didn't expect? Um, Well, I don't think I was expecting that result, to be honest. Mm. Um, Also, obviously, it does depend on the quality of the priors that people initially have, right? Like if you if you actually do have very highly uninformed individuals and aggregating more highly uninformed priors is not going to help you. (laughs) Um, Shit in, shit out. (laughs) Yeah, basically. I get to swear on my own show. (laughs) (laughs) I, well, I could just say that you said it. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think that we should run more studies or, or less on the basis of, of this uh, paper? Well, I mean, I don't think that's the right. Uh, I mean, it's not like we there's not a real trade off here, like have, uh, you know, more democratic decision making processes mm. or run additional studies. We can do both. <laughs> um, mm. So. I think, you know, more studies still is going to help, but, you know, so is actually, you know, taking that evidence into consideration and also um, having more people help to make decisions and um, hopefully balance out some of the errors that are made. Because actually a lot of, I mean, I've also done some work looking at, you know, how policymakers interpret evidence from studies and update. So so you kind of modeled bureaucrats or politicians as kind of these these Bayesian a- agents who I guess up- update perfectly. Was that right? At least in this paper. Oh, um, there's right. another paper that does not do that, but yeah. Yeah, what, what kind of deviations uh, might you expect? Do you, do you think that they might update too much or, or too little in the real world? Um, well, I think actually, so I've got this other paper um, with Aidan Koval of the World Bank where we are looking at precisely some of the biases that policymakers have. And one of the bigger ones is that people are perfectly happy to update on new evidence when that goes in a nice, you know, positive, uh, when it's good news, you know, but people really hate to update based on bad news. So, you know, so for example, if you think that the effects of a uh, conditional cash transfer program on enrollment rates is that maybe they'll increase enrollment rates by three percentage points. And then, you know, we can randomly show you some information that either says it's five or it's one. Mm. Well, if we show you information that says it's five, you're like, great, it's five. If we show you some information that says one, you're like, eh, maybe it's two. Um, <laughs> so we see that kind of bias. Um, it's we interesting because, also- I mean, if you update negatively or if, if you update downwards, then you're creating a g- much greater possibility for future exciting positive updates later on. <laughs> You, you, you kind of you, you can't have uh, you know positive updates without negative updates as well. Well, that's fair. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess I guess they're not thinking that way. <laughs> <laughs> Present bias or something? No, yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah, and I mean it, it kind of makes sense intuitively because I mean one of the you know initial reasons for why we're considering this particular bias in the first place is I think a situation that'll be very familiar to people who engage with policymakers is you know you're asked to do an impact evaluation Mm. you come back saying oh yeah this thing showed no effect and people are like oh really like it must be the impact evaluation that's wrong like (laughs) (laughs) I wonder like it's it's notorious that that impact evaluations within bureaucracies that want to protect their own programs are too too optimistic. But I wonder it's a bit like kind of everyone overstates how tall they are on dating sites. Kind of, <laughs> but 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 it, but at the end of the day, you kind of end up knowing how tall someone is because kind of everyone overstates by the same amount. And I wonder if looking at these impact evaluations, you can kind of figure out what's the truth uh, or like what what's right on average just by saying, well, how was it extremely good or was it merely good? <laughs> you, just, you you just adjust everything down by a bit. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, no, fair enough. I mean, the other I, thing I, I that I suppose found... that would that would just end up rewarding even more extreme lying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, that's not the only bias that people have got either, right? So like, another thing that we were looking at is how people were taking or not taking the variance um, into consideration. 
Um, sort of in the simplest idea, you can think of this as just sampling variants, but um, you know, you can also look at heterogeneity across studies. And basically, people were not updating correctly based on confidence intervals. If uh, that might be the easiest way of framing it, um, and we did try to like break that down a bit and try to say, well, okay, but why is that? Are they uh, misinterpreting what a confidence interval is? Is it some kind of aggregation failure? Is it just that they're ignoring all new information? And so obviously they're going to be caring less about confidence intervals than somebody who actually does take information into consideration and does actually update it all. Um, mm. But uh, so we did try to break it down in several ways. Um, and yeah, it does seem like people are not taking you know, the variance into account as a Bayesian would. Oh, uh, hold on. So you're saying that they just look at they just look at the point result and not at how uncertain it was? Yeah, pretty uh, much. I mean, okay. I mean, they they do look a little bit at how uncertain it was, but not as much as they should if they were, mm. you know, fully Bayesian. Like if they were actually Bayesian, then they would do some. Then they would care more about the right. confidence intervals. So this, this would be a small study that kind of gets a fluky extreme result. People exactly. people over rely on that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. Okay, that doesn't surprise me. So what is the latest on on your work on on priors? Is that related yeah. to, to this paper? So it is. Um, so this is one of the things that I've been up to is, um, so for this particular one, we were looking at biases that policymakers might have and um, biases in updating. So, you know, you start out with a Bayesian model and say, okay, well, look, but people aren't Bayesian. How can we modify this model and have some kind of quasi-Bayesian model? Um, and so we were looking at uh, two biases this kind of optimism I was talking about and uh, this variance neglect, um, which is, you can think of it as basically some kind of extension neglect more broadly and related to the hot hand fallacy or gambler's fallacy for mm. people who are into the behavioral economics literature. And we basically, it was a really simple study. We just collected uh, people's priors. We then showed them some results from studies and then we got their posteriors. And we presented information in different ways because we were also interested in knowing if, you know, the way in which we present information can also help people overcome biases if they are biased. So, you know, if you've got a problem, what's the solution kind of thing. Mm. And we did this not just for policymakers, but also for researchers, um, for practitioners like NGO operational staff, that kind of thing. We also got a, you know, side sample of uh, MTurk participants. And, uh, you know, these biases actually turned out to be pretty general. And, uh, yeah, the, the big thing on the solution side is more information will um, encourage people to update more on the evidence. So I guess if you're in that situation of, you know, you've got some bad news, um, you know, come bearing a lot of data and that should help at least a little bit. Um, so, you know, more quantiles of the data, um, that kind of thing, maximum, minimum values, you know, the whole range of as many statistics as you can, really. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. So, so, so your main finding was that in order to accept a, a negative result, uh, people have to be confronted with with a overwhelming evidence so that they can't ignore it. Yeah, yeah. At least it should help. Mm. Well, yeah. Were, were there any other discoveries? The other uh, kinds of things that we've been doing, we I've actually collected priors in a whole bunch of different settings. Um, so, actually, I'm in the process also uh, with a grad student of trying to look at some additional biases that policymakers may have like emission bias, um, status quo bias, where people don't want to actually, you know, change, deviate from uh, decisions that were, you know, made in the past where they would have to do something, you know, differently um, or take action. Um, like there might be some bias towards it in action. Or at least not, not changing your action, <laughs> not shutting down yeah. the program. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the kinds of things that bureaucracies are typically sort of criticized for, <laughs> But more specifically on the priors, we've also, you know, asked experts to predict um, effects of various impact evaluations. One thing that I'm really excited about is trying to more systematically collect priors in the future. So um, I've been talking with uh, many people, actually, um, including uh, Stefano de Lavinia and Devin Pope, who've got these great uh, papers on expert predictions about setting up some a larger website so that in the future people could sort of more systematically collect priors for their research projects. Um, I'm getting at this point like 
you know, an email every week, roughly, um, you know, asking for, you know, advice on collecting priors, because I think mm. researchers are very interested in collecting priors for their projects, because it makes sense from their perspective, like they're highly incentivized to do so, because like, mm. it helps with not just, you know, all this updating work, but also for them personally, it's like, well, now nobody can say that, you know, they knew the results of my study all along. Like I can <laughs> tell them, well, this is what people thought beforehand and this is the benefits of my research. Um, and also if I have null results, then it makes the null results more interesting because, you know, people, we didn't expect that. Um, so, you know, the researchers are incentivized to gather these things, but I think that given that, well, we should be doing that a little bit more systematically to be able to say some interesting things about like, well, for example, one thing is that people's priors might, on average, be pretty accurate. I mean, and so this is what we saw with the uh, researchers when we gathered uh, researchers' priors, that uh, they were quite accurate on average. In individuals, they were, you know, off by quite a lot. This is the kind of wisdom of the crowds thing. Mm. But, you know, if you think that you, you could get some wisdom of the crowds and that people are pretty accurate overall if you aggregate, well, that actually suggests that, you know, that's, could be a good yardstick to use in those situations where we don't have RCTs. And it mm. could even help us figure out, well, where should we do an RCT? Like, where are we not really certain what the effect will be? And we need an RCT to come in and arbitrate, mm. as it were. So I think there's a lot more to do there that, you know, could be pretty high value. Right. Okay. So I've got, I've got a number of questions here. I guess, I guess so the question we're, we're trying to answer, to, well, at least one of them is, uh, how good are experts as a whole at predicting the likely uh, outcome of a of a study that you're that you're going to conduct, or you know, to put it another way, the impact of an intervention? And I guess the stuff that I've read is that experts, at least individual experts, are not very reliable. But you're saying that if you systematically collect the expectations of many different experts, then on average they can be surprisingly good. Yeah, yeah, I would say that. I mean, I think that like again, it's going to depend a bit on. This is why it would be really nice to get like systematic data across many, many different situations, because it, it could just be that the ones that we've looked at so far are not particularly surprising. But, mm. you know, there are probably some situations in which, uh, you know, people are able to predict things less well. And it would be nice to know, like, are there some characteristics of studies that can, you know, help to tell us when, you know, um, experts are going to be good or bad at predicting this kind of thing. Mm. Uh, but I would agree that, you know, uh, any one individual expert is going to be fairly wildly off i think <laughs> mm. so so how do you actually uh, solicit these these priors or these you know expectations from from these experts uh, have you figured out the best way of doing that yeah so that's an excellent question and we tried uh several different things uh by now i think i've got a pretty good idea of what works so in some sense the gold standard if people can understand it which is a big if is to ask people to put weights in different bins because then you can get the distributions mm. of their priors as well like not just a mean but sort of you know how much uncertainty is uh, captured in that but that's uh, quite hard for most people to do people aren't really used to thinking of their beliefs as putting weights in bins. Mm. <laughs> um, not, not, and, not even not even people in this field of social science? Not really. I mean, the researchers are a bit better at it, but, mm. you know, in any case, at least what we've done is e even when talking with researchers, it's better to try to be perfectly clear about, you know, what the bins mean and go through all that kind of thing beforehand. The other thing is, uh, if you are asking sort of more of a lay public is it's probably better to move to asking them to sort of give ranges, as it were. So, you know, what is a value such that you think that it's, you know, less than 10% 10, 10 chance that it'll, it'll fall below this value or less than 10% chance it'll fall above this value mm. or, you know, different quantiles. I mean, you'd then have to make some assumptions about the actual distribution uh, because, you know, people can put can give you a range, but if you really want to get at some of the updating questions, you need to know a little bit more, like you want to know whether those distributions are normal or not. And you don't know whether things are normally distributed if you just have like three points, right? Right, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. 
So that sounds like a really exciting uh, research agenda, but uh, we've got to push on because there's quite a lot of other papers that you've published in the last few years that I want to talk about. (laughs) So another one uh, that that you've written up, which is a bit more hopeful, is uh, how often should we believe positive results assessing the credibility of research findings in development economics? And of course, most, most of social science is facing a replication crisis where we're just finding that many published results in, in papers don't pan out when, when you try to do the experiment again. Uh, what, what did you find in, in development economics? Yeah, so actually the situation was a lot better uh, than I would have initially thought. So I think this is, a, you know, actually quite a positive result that, I mean, it could be biased from the kinds of studies that we included. Like we had a lot of conditional cash transfers in there. They tend to have very large sample sizes. So they're kind of like the best case scenario. But nonetheless, that you know, the uh, false positive uh, report probabilities were actually quite small. So uh, are you able to to describe the the method that you applied in in that paper? Because, I mean, obviously you weren't replicating lots of these studies. You must have used some other method to to reach this conclusion. Yep. So there's actually, well, quite a lot of uh, nice literature here that I can refer people on to. Um, So the uh, false positive and false negative report probabilities, the equations for how to calculate those are coming from out, out of a paper by Wachholder et al. And there's some other people who have also looked at this, where essentially um, the probability that um, you've got a false positive or false negative depends a bit on the priors that you've got. So for example, if you think of some study that um, is looking at, I don't know, something we really don't believe to exist, Mm -hmm. like uh, extrasensory perception or something, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and if you found some positive result for that, well, nobody's going to trust a study that shows that ESP is real. And to Mm -hmm. really, you know, show that credibly, you would need to have lots of studies with really precisely estimated, you know, coefficients. So again, like your priors would go into it, the statistical significance of, you know, your p-values that you found would go into it. And that's just an equation you can sort of write out. The other thing is that uh, there are these uh, type S and type M errors that Andrew Gelman and some co-authors talk about. And these are the probability that if you've got a statistically significant result, it's actually of the right sign. And, so, so it's positive uh, rather than negative or negative rather than positive. Yeah, yeah, because you would be surprised. But it's actually <laughs> true that if you've got low powered results, then even if you find something statistically significant, um, you know, there is some probability that <laughs> the true value is negative when you see something that says it's positive or vice versa. Yeah. And then there's type M errors. Yeah, so this is the same kind of thing except for magnitude. So, you know, you found some significant result and it has a certain magnitude, but chances are that's actually incorrect in some way. Like it's most likely inflated um, in value. So the truth is likely to low, lie lower than that. Hmm. So, so how did how did you put together this information to try to figure out what fraction of of results were were accurate? I'm not quite I'm not quite understanding that. Sure, sure, sure. So the main uh, source of data that we used here is we had to get a whole bunch of expert beliefs because these were inputs into the equations, and to get the expert beliefs. So we did one thing that's you know not. 100% kosher, but is the best kind of approximation we could do, um, which is that, you know, we didn't want to wait until a lot of impact evaluations were over. Like a lot of the other work that I've done on priors, also with Aiden, we are actually waiting until all the results of the real studies come out. Mm. But for this, we wanted a bunch of results to use already, as it were. So what we did was we used aid grades database of impact evaluation results, and we said, okay, let's go to um, sort of topic experts, like people who have, for example, done a study on a conditional cash transfer program, and then ask them, which of all these other programs um, have you heard about? Um, There were also all conditional cash transfer programs, but, you know, ones by other people. Mm. And then for the ones that they hadn't heard about, we asked them to make up to five predictions about the effects that mm. uh, those studies would find. So we described the studies to them in great detail and um, then got their best guess. And then using this data, we could uh, say something about false right. positive report probability because then we've got the p-value that each study found mm. and we've got the 
you know, what we're considering to be the prior probability of some kind of non-null um, effect, we needed actually them to also give a certain value below which they would consider the uh, study to have not been successful. Like, mm. you know, say a conditional cash transfer program doesn't improve enrollment rates by, I don't know, five percentage points, then it's not successful. Mm. Because we wanted to, I mean, all these equations deal with sort of like, you know, the likelihood that some particular hypothesis is true. So for us, we wanted some, there was like some critical threshold that above which we would think that it had an effect versus not have an effect, mm. you know, some meaningful effect, the minimum meaningful, <laughs> kind of like the minimum detectable effect size. Yeah. So we create uh, this probability of attaining this uh, non-null effect given their prior, the distribution of priors and given this particular cutoff threshold. And those are just inputs to this equation mm. along with the power of the study. Right. Okay, so I think I understand now. So you've got all of these different studies looking at the, the effect size on, on, on different outcomes and they have different levels of power, so different kind of sample sizes and different variances in them. And then you're collecting priors from a bunch of different kind of subject matter experts and then you're thinking, well, if we took those priors and updated appropriately based on the results in those studies, how often would we end up uh, forming the wrong conclusion? Or, or is it actually just that what if you took the point estimate from that study, how often would you be wrong relative to if you'd updated in, in, a, in a Bayesian way? Is, is the second one right? Um, or am I totally wrong? <laughs> so. so I would think of it in a different way. So if you see... A positive significant result mm. you know there's some probability that it just happened to be that way you know by chance, by chance and there's right. some probability that that's a true thing and, and especially if it was unlikely to begin with then it's it may well still probably be wrong because of kind of yes. regression to the mean effects but yeah i mean so if you think that it's really unlikely a priori and you observe it, it's more likely to be a false positive. If yeah. you're underpowered to begin with, it's more likely to be a false positive. If it's got, you know, a p-value of 0.049, <laughs> it's more likely to be a false positive. So these are all just sort of factors that go into it. And you could do the same kind of thing for false negatives, actually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, let's let's push on. So you did another paper on specification searching, which is the practice where people who are writing a paper try out a whole lot of different specifications to try to, I guess, get get the answer that they'd like, and then they then they publish uh, just just the results that they'd like to show you. And you were trying to figure out how how common this practice is in in uh, different disciplines and researchers using different methods. So how did you try to do that, and, and what did you find? Yeah. So. This paper is uh, similar in methodology to uh, some papers by Gerber and Mahotra and others where, and also uh, there's some work by Brodeur et al, looking at essentially the distribution of uh, statistics. So, you know, say you've got a bunch of different studies, you've got a bunch of different Z statistics from each of those results. What you would expect is that there's going to be some smooth distribution of those statistics, I mean, hopefully. Uh, but what you actually observe in the data is there's some lumpiness. And in particular, there tends to be like some slightly lower density of results that are just marginally insignificant than you would expect in some uh, sort of bump in the distribution just above the mm. threshold for statistical significance, which is usually at, you know, the 0.05 level, so um, 1.96. So mm. you'll see, like, you know, relatively few results around, you know, 1.95 and relatively more results than you would mm. anticipate having around, you know, 1.97. That's the general, in, you know, intuition, right? And, yeah. And, and that's an indication that people were fishing around to find the specification that would just get them over the line to be able to publish. Exactly. But it, I mean, it's not as straightforward as just that, because you can imagine that, you know, so 
what is that distribution supposed to look like in reality? And there's other reasons why you might expect to see some more statistically significant results. For example, people design the studies such that they can find significant results in the first place. So it's not 100% straightforward to just say, oh, yeah, well, we've got a lot of significant results and therefore it must be specification searching. Mm -hmm. I think it becomes more credible that it is specification searching if you can say, yeah, but it's like within a really small band right around, you know, the threshold for significance. Like as you get, as you expand the band out a little bit, I think, you know, you could try to argue. Yeah, exactly. That like people are designing this, the study very cleverly Uh, just to get, you know, significance. Although honestly, to be fair, I think it's difficult to swallow that people are designing the study perfectly appropriately to just barely get statistical significance, right? I mean, it's so hard to predict what the effects will Mm. be anyways. And then your hands are a little bit tied from the fact that, you know, generally when you're doing this, you have got a given budget and you can't really exceed that budget anyways. So you're dealing with a certain sample size and having to, you know, adapt uh, your study accordingly. It's not like you've got free reign to, yeah. you know, perfectly so, maximize. So Okay, so the, so the alternative innocent explanation is that people, they, they can anticipate ahead of time what the effect size will be, and then they choose the sample size that will allow them to get just below 0.05 p-value so that they'll, they'll be able to publish the paper at minimum cost. But yeah, but, but in yeah. reality, it's just it's it's a bit hard to believe that that's, that that's explains most of what's going on, especially given that we just know that lots of academics, in fact, do do uh, specification searching. Yeah. I mean, it's just people don't have as fine control over the design of the study as you would perhaps anticipate because, I mean, you know, funding is somewhat out of their hands. Also, because any one given paper is going to be looking at so many different outcomes, right? So how can you really design a study so that you are just barely significant for outcome A and B and C, you know? And so like... yeah. It's a little bit, it becomes a little bit implausible, but that would be, you know, the best case for the uh, contrary view. Yeah. Okay. So you looked for this suspicious clumping of p-values or or effect sizes across, I guess, a whole lot of different methods and disciplines. And and what did you find? Yeah. So um, actually the situation seemed a lot better for RCTs than non-RCTs, which is kind of understandable if you think about it, because I think, you know, RCTs generally have an easier time getting published these days anyways. So, you know, it could be reflecting that, that you don't need to engage in specification searching if you've got an <laughs> RCT and people are, you know, more likely to, um, you know, publish your results anyways, even if they're null. Mm. Um, the other thing is the things do seem to be changing a little bit over time. So in particular, the non-RCTs, as time goes on, they become more and more significant, as it were. Let's just not lean too hard on this uh, explanation, but it sure. could be, you know, in the old days, maybe you would lie and say, well, I've got a non-RCT and it found, uh, you know, a value of um, 1.97. Mm-hmm. And people would be like, oh, okay, 1.97, I believe that. And nowadays, if you see 1.97, everybody's like, wait a second. So now, you know, you'll see values that are more like 2.1 or something, right? It's like values that are a little bit farther out there and more significant. I see. Okay, so you're saying because people have learned that this is kind of an indication of specification searching, people have to go even further and find specifications that get them an even more significant (laughs) result so so it doesn't look suspicious. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Mm. I mean, that would be the intuition. I mean, again, I can't like 100% say, but it would be consistent with that at least. It sounds uh, to me like you've you've been doing quite a lot of work on this this Bayesian, Bayesian approach. Uh, looking at you know priors and updating based on those. Does it feel like development economics is is becoming more Bayesian, and and is that a good thing? Hmm. You know, actually, honestly, I believe it is, um, and that's really exciting. I mean, you know, these days I don't have to worry quite so much. I think about. I mean, I, I'm definitely hardcore Bayesian, um, and. I think that it's a little bit easier for me to talk about things that rely on a Bayesian interpretation. Hmm. Do you think there's any downsides of Bayesian methods being being applied more often? I guess one thing I worry about is people kind of fiddling with the priors in order to get the outcome that they want. Or, or perhaps there's a bit more flexibility in that, and there's more, more possibility for specification searching. Hmm. Honestly, we're probably not going to go down the route of being like, um, I, I don't see the discipline as becoming fully beige in any time in the near mm. future. Yeah, I just don't see the likelihood of that. What I do think, though, is that so 
it is true that what researchers do and what policymakers do could be a bit different and might be fine to be different. Like I've heard the argument that, well, researchers should be very concerned about getting unbiased estimates and mm. policymakers. So there's this uh, variance, sorry, bias variance trade off that a lot of um, that I care actually very passionately about and the other cares passionately <laughs> about too as well, do, I do, believe. Do, do, do you want to explain what that is? Sure. So the, the bias variance trade-off is essentially saying that um, you've got several sources of prediction error. Um, you've got some error due to possible biases. You've got some error due to um, variance and you've got some other idiosyncratic error. And this is something that is sort of generally true in all contexts and all ways and comes up in different ways. So an example is if you think of like nearest neighbor matching, if you want, you can include uh, more neighbors. And if you include more neighbors, um, you've got more observations. So you've got uh, more precise estimates, like lower variance estimates. But on the other hand, if you're including more neighbors, you've got some worse matches. So you're increasing your bias. And so like all estimation approaches are going to have some error due to bias and some error due to variance. And mm. economists have focused really narrowly on producing unbiased estimates. And if you all you care about is prediction error, I know Andrew Gelman takes this view, and so do I, and so do other people like uh, Rachel Meager, I think, and others. Um, you know, we're like, well, hang on, like, why do we care just so much about getting unbiased estimates? Don't you also care about having precise estimates too? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it would help for prediction error to maybe accept a little bit of bias. And the argument I've heard is that, well. Maybe researchers should be unbiased, but policymakers interpreting the evidence, you know, it's okay to accept a bit more bias there. But like maybe the, you know, you don't need every person at every layer to be reducing prediction error as much as possible. I think that like in practical terms, like, you know, if you're an effective altruist, et cetera, you do care about minimizing prediction error mm. regardless of the source. But then it's a slightly separate question to say what researchers should be doing per se. Mm. So I'll stick up links to both Andrew Gelman's blog and a description of the uh, bias uh, variance trade-off. So, so as I understand it, you're saying that there's different statistical methods that you could use that would be systematically too optimistic or pessimistic, but would be more precise. Is that right? And in general, people go for something that's neither too optimistic or pessimistic, but is not not as precise as it might be. It has like larger average mistakes. Um, and, and it's just not clear why why we've chosen that, that particular approach. Yeah. So there's a nice diagram that you can throw up if you're putting links to things that sort of shows the bias variance trade off really, really nicely, I think, mm. where you've got, you know, prediction error on one axis and you've got different curves of, you know, error for if you've got um, biased estimates or if you've got estimates with high variance, um, low precision. And, you know, your total prediction error is going to be some function of both of these things as well as, you know, some other error. And uh, economists have focused really quite a lot on getting unbiased estimates. Mm. You would think that if anywhere, this consideration might come up a little bit in approaches using machine learning because there there's a lot of techniques that are biased um, that people accept like lasso or ridge regressions and all sorts of other things but even there there's if you talk to people who are actually involved with these kinds of methods they're highly focused on getting unbiased estimates so that the rest <laughs> of the profession accepts them um, which i think is kind of a shame in some regards but again i want to be a little bit agnostic because i'm not 100 percent sure actually myself what is the best way of going about it i just feel that at least at the time of making a policy decision, we should be minimizing overall prediction error, regardless of the source of that error, whether it's bias or variance. I'm not sure what the researchers should do. That's, I think, like I say, a slightly separate problem. But I do think we're not paying attention to prediction error as much as we should. All right, let's turn now to uh, some of the implications of this work and some research that we've done for people involved in the effective altruism uh, movement. 
So we, we wrote this article, uh, is it fair to say that most social interventions don't work? Uh, ben, ben Todd worked on that and put it up last year. And it's, and it's one of the articles on our site that I, that I like, that I think the most out of, out of all of them. And the reason that we looked into it is uh, in, in a lot of our talks for many years, we'd been saying uh, most social interventions, if you look at them, uh, don't work on, on the basis of looking at lots of randomized controlled trials and saying, well, most of them seem to produce null results. The interventions that they're looking at uh, don't seem to be helping. But then we had some, had some doubts about that because we're thinking, well, it's possible that you're getting false negatives, for example. Uh, and it's possible that you know an intervention works in some circumstances and and not others. Uh, so, is, is there anything that you want to want to say about that article? Possibly, we could we could walk through the various different uh, moves moves that we take, and then and then try to reach a reach a conclusion about it. Yeah, I mean, it's a really difficult question because, like you say, there are lots of things that go into it. Null results could just be underpowered. The other big thing is that, I mean. Unfortunately, we tend to do impact evaluations in some of the better situations in the first place, and this would mm. sort of work in the other direction. Like, so many impact evaluations just fall apart and never happen, and we don't actually observe their outcomes because, mm. you know, the study just fell apart. So yeah, it's hard to say to be honest, but yeah, happy to walk so, through. If sure, I'm. sure. Okay, so so one of the things is uh, only some uh, interventions are ever evaluated, and they're probably ones that are better than others because you'd only bother spending the money on an RCT if it if it looks really positive. Do, do you have any sense of how big that effect is? Honestly, I don't, but I will say that there's been there have been some people looking at you know. The impact evaluations that don't end up happening, like um, David McKenzie and some other people were trying to pull together some estimates of this. Um, and I think that problem is actually quite large. It's not necessarily that it's, um, you know, it's a little bit distinct from the problem that, you know, we only try to study those things that are that have some chance of being really highly effective. It's also that even within a particular topic that is highly effective or that we suspect is highly effective, the ones that end up happening are the better instantiations of that particular program. <laughs> like, you know, the government in that particular area had it more together or whatever else, you know. So mm. we're getting biased estimates as well that way. Okay, so so we, we kind of start with this quote from uh, David Anderson, uh, who, who does research in this area. And he says, um, it looks like 75% of social interventions that, that he's seen ha have weak or no effects. And this suggests that it might might even even be worse than that, uh, because there's all of these programs that aren't even being evaluated, which are probably worse. So you know maybe it's eighty or ninety percent of social interventions uh, have, have small or no effects. But uh, there's there's other things that we need to think about. So there's lots of different outcomes that, that you could look at uh, when when you're studying an intervention. Mm -hmm. um, so that you might think, well, you got this change in a school, like should it be expected to improve their math scores or their English scores or like how much they enjoy being at school? All of these different things. Which uh, I guess that pushes in the direction of being over optimistic because the, the the papers that get published can kind of fish for whichever one they found a significant uh, effect in. But but even if we were honestly reporting the results, it then just becomes kind of unclear which were the things that you kind of expected it to have an effect on anyway. It's it's it just it just makes it quite confusing. Like what actually are we saying when we say seventy five percent of things have weak or no effects? Is is it was it just the primary effect or, or many of them? Yeah, I, that's totally fair because, you know, oftentimes a study will throw in all sorts of random other things that they don't actually honestly anticipate there being effect on. But, you mm. know, th if you're doing the study anyways, why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it turns out that this change at the school didn't make the students happier. I mean, would you expect it to anyway? Like maybe they were just curious about that. Uh, so it's really uh, yeah unclear what, what you're sampling across. Then there's this issue of, you know, uh, we said no effect or, or weak effects is, is often how, how this quote uh, is, is given. But then what is a weak effect? Uh, that's just kind of a subjective judgment about, you know, is, is it relative to the cost? Is it relative to the statistical significance? Uh, is it like, you know, is it material? Again, that just kind of muddies the water. And uh, if, if you think about it, uh, it becomes a much more of a subjective kind of claim. Do you have anything to add to that? Not really. I mean... <laughs> does, 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 does this come up in your own research? So... I mean, to me, what I would find the important question is actually in some ways, I, I realized that, uh, you know, obviously for the purposes of, of this um, post that you put together with Ben Todd, etc., I think that the question is really interesting of which have any effect whatsoever, but I would a little bit think that another important question would be, um, you know, which matter relative to some, you mm. know, 
other outside, you know, like, I guess, you know, which matter at all is a good question, but <laughs> I, I always think about what is the outside option um, yeah. and what the outside option really matters. Like, so when you're talking about weak effects, like, mm. yeah, probably they are talking about statistical significance, but you know, you can also think of weak effects as like, well, sure, it has an effect, but so what? Like, you know, we can do so much better. Mm, yeah. And then uh, I think the part of the of the article that, that you helped with was moving from talking about individual studies, where very often you get null results, to meta-analyses where you combine different studies. And then more often, I think you find that, uh, that an intervention works, at least on average. Do, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so I mean, you could if you've got some um, underpowered studies, then combining them does tend to improve um, the situation slightly. Um, I mean, it depends a little bit on exactly how you're doing it and what kinds of things you're including. But I would say, by and large, you know, you do end up with um, because you're essentially adding some power when you do a meta-analysis uh, by at least partially pulling results from different studies. Mm. And so you can pick up smaller effects. Yeah. Uh, which means that I guess more of them become like just jump over the line of being positive or, or material yeah, or, well, or observable. Yeah, becoming, becoming significant, not mm. necessarily, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like mm. it, it could be like a very, you know, small effect. But yeah. uh, well, there, there, there's a bunch of other moves that we make here or, or adjustments up and down. But what we were trying to kind of get at is is how much of a gain do you get by picking you know the best interventions or trying to be to be evidence-based rather than just picking something at random and i think the conclusion that that we reached after looking at all of this is that it's perhaps not as much as you might you know or pe people who are extremely supportive of doing more empirical work might hope because one is that the, the measurements are somewhat poor so there's a good chance often of you think that you've chosen the best intervention from a pool but but in fact you've gotten it wrong but also that even if there's like a few into, you know, a small fraction of the interventions that you might be sampling from that are much more effective than others, uh, even if you choose at random, you still have a reasonable chance of picking one of those anyway, uh, <laughs> which, which means that, you know, let's say that there's like 10 different interventions and only one of them works. If you pick at random, you can't do worse than like a, than a tenth as well as definitely picking the best one because you have a one in 10 chance of picking it anyway. I did, yeah, which which I guess is it, it's perhaps something that I think effective altruism hadn't hadn't thought uh, as as much about. We, we often tended to compare the very best interventions with the very worst ones, but uh, it'd be very peculiar strategy to try to find the very worst ones and and, and do those. <laughs> um, and, and instead, you should really compare you know your your attempt at picking the best intervention with kind of picking at random among things that have been studied. In which case, you know the the multiple in effectiveness that you get probably isn't going to be huge. Uh, do, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, this is a little bit similar to when I was trying to look at like how much we can learn from an impact evaluation and had to make assumptions about what that outside option is that the policymakers are considering. And just sort of based on the distribution of effects that I saw in aid grades database, um, you know, I, I thought it's actually reasonable that, you know, a lot of these projects I mean, a lot of interventions have got somewhat similar effect sizes mm. uh, without, at least without taking um, cost effectiveness into consideration. And obviously, I would love to take costs into consideration, but it's very hard to because like, mm. you know, 10% of studies say anything about costs and then it's not very credible when they do. So, mm. <laughs> so you know, but things were uh, pretty tightly distributed. So, I mean, I tried some different specifications, like I was saying, like trying out like 50% of uh, the effect of another program or 90% of the effect of another program. Like how well can you distinguish between, you know, two programs, one of which is 90% of the value of the other one, as it were. Mm. But, you know, you have to make some pretty strong assumptions there. Things do seem to be, yeah. So I don't know. That's that's so how I've gone about it in the past. Things, things seem to be what? Uh, fairly clumped together, you're saying? Well... Out of the ones in aid grades database, and again, without taking costs into consideration. Right. So I'm uh, not trying to make a broader claim than that because mm. I, there's just no data. Right. Okay. So I was, I was just about to bring this up next, which is like four years ago or so, uh, Robin Hansen uh, responded to, to one of your graphs from aid grade, which, was, which, which seemed to suggest that if you looked at effect sizes in terms of standard deviation improvements, then you kind of found a normal distribution of effect sizes and it wasn't that widely dispersed, as you're saying. 
And he was saying, well, this is a bit in conflict with the, with the standard line that uh, people in effective altruism give, which is that there's you know, massive distributions in, in how cost-effective different, different approaches are, that it's not just normal, but it's you know, log normal or power law distributed or something like that, which gives you much greater dispersion between, between the best and the average and the worst. Uh, did, did, you, did you ever respond to that? Because I think we ended up concluding it might be a bit of a misunderstanding. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that yeah, so there's two things that are certainly not included. One thing I just alluded to is costs. Like mm. th- that's saying nothing about the cost effectiveness of a particular intervention. And I would mm. love to have been able to produce those graphs for the cost effectiveness. But like I say, the thing is that papers just don't report costs and mm. they should, but they don't do. So it's really hard for me to come in as an outsider to <laughs> each of these papers and say, oh, yeah, but actually I know what the costs are. I mean, you know, one could make strong assumptions about those and try to, you know, infer what costs are from other studies, etc. cetera. But um, it's quite hard to do and not very credible. So, I mean, I'm sure one could do it, but probably not in an academic setting. <laughs> um, so yeah. I haven't been pursuing it, but I would love for other people to pursue it. And I'm mm. sure that other people are pursuing it. Well, the other and thing, then, if you want to move to cost effectiveness, you also have to think about the actual welfare gain from the different improvements yeah so that's the other thing i was going to say is then like well then how can you actually value these outcomes because like you know the outcomes are pretty they don't have intuitive value to them right like you know how do you value an extra year in school versus a centimeter of height right like what how do you think about that kind (laughs) of thing like what does that actually mean in terms of value so then you need some additional like mapping from the outcomes to Mm. you know something that we value so yeah is is it possible that we start with this normal distribution uh, of standard deviation changes and then because costs are so like or costs per recipient are so wildly distributed and the benefits uh, per standard deviation improvement are so wildly distributed that you still get a very wide dispersion in the cost effectiveness of different interventions you could do Mm, yeah I mean I I just have not a very clear sense of that because I don't have a clear sense of the costs right Um, okay so just it's it's not it's not dispositive. <laughs> Other people could look at this and try to figure that out. Yeah, yeah. And I, I really hope somebody does. <laughs> I guess there's also the, the Disease Control Priorities Project, of course, has produced cost effectiveness estimates for lots of different health treatments and finds that they're extremely widely dispersed. But I think that the, their resourcing per intervention that they're looking at isn't so good. And very often they rely on modeling rather than empirical results, which might be causing them to, over, to overstate uh, the variance because some of it is just uh, mistakes on their part. I see. Yeah, no, I've heard a little bit about that. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think that, you know, one thing that is certainly necessary and I hope happens in the near future is, you know, some attempt at also adding values to these other things that we might care about, right? Like all the educational stuff, et cetera, to sort of be able to compare them with health interventions, et cetera. Because, yeah, the same kind of way that they they do the you know, disability adjusted life years, et cetera, they could do for some kind of, you know, more general well-being. <laughs> right, yeah. So I really want to try to pin you down a little bit on you know, how, how valuable is being empirical? Because it seems like well, you, you've got some positive results and some negative results. You know, you've got the generalizability doesn't seem so good. So, so can we really learn so much? On the other hand, it looked like well, some of your research suggests that, in fact, the, most of the results that show positive effects, you know, are kind of right about that. And then, and then we've got to consider, I guess, the cost of doing these different studies and whether people actually respond to it in government. Do, do you have, I mean, you've been working in this area for now, you know, five or 10 years now. H- have you updated in favor of, of empirical social science or, or, or against it? Well, I think it's the only game in town, to be honest. Like, you know, as much as we may criticize some of the things that come out of standard research I guess the only answer in terms of what to do next is well more of the same you know and with some improvements but you know more is better and I think people are a little bit more aware of and focused on you know addressing some of the limitations in past research both in terms of um, you know people are thinking more now about you know the differences in scale up people are thinking a, a bit more now about how results actually feed into the policy process. Um, Mm. So, I mean, I think there's incremental change, but, um, you know, I'm certainly pro-empirical work because what's, you know, what's the alternative? It's not so... Well, I I think think there are alternatives. I mean, one is, as you were saying, just survey people on their expectations about what works even before you've run any studies. And it could just be that that's that gets you a lot of the way and it costs very little. So maybe we should just do that and then and then screw the RCTs or only do them occasionally. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't want to rule out the possibility that we can learn something from, I think we can learn more using observational data, um, which, you know, priors would also be similar to. And I don't want to rule out that we can learn something from those. I just, 
maybe this is just a matter of semantics. Like I would still consider that in some sense empirical work because okay. what you could do is try to say, well, yes, but I want to try to a systematic figure out which are the and- situ- <laughs> yeah, figure out the situations in which this is actually, you know, relatively okay. And then it's, you know, some approximation strategy that's still not quite valid, but better than nothing. And, you know, I think that's still somewhat empirical. Yeah. Well, you're the third person that, that I've brought this question up with uh, on, on the show. And I think part of it is that I feel a little bit of guilt from, uh, I, I used to work at Giving What We Can, and we, and we pushed this view that, you know, people should base their giving on randomized controlled trial results uh, pretty hard. And now I, I, I do just have some doubts about, you know, whether we had at least strong evidence at the time to, to know that basing your decisions on that actually actually is such good advice. Uh, one is, you know, uh, the results often aren't that reliable, that they don't generalize, uh, they're expensive to, uh, to, to deliver. So, so maybe we should use other methods. I mean, I, I just like, I guess you're saying that these surveys of, of opinion are empirical in their own way, but they're kind of a different, they're a different sort of empiricism, you know, speaking to people who have some experience on the, on the ground of what they think works and, and what doesn't. And then getting their kind of just overall judgment about how the system that they've observed functions and what they expect might might move it in one way or another. That, that's that's kind of what the RC, the RCT movement was was pushing against. Was this like oh we'll just just rely on experts to to kind of intuitively know what what works and what doesn't? But RCTs have their own problems, and 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 maybe maybe that method was more cost effective in its own way. Yeah, I mean. I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily pit these against each other. You can even think that there could be some ways of integrating them. Like, for example, one thing I've thought somebody should do, and I'm saying this because I hope that somebody who is listening actually goes and do this. Cause yeah. That's just because I don't want to do it myself, but I hope somebody <laughs> does it. Um, is, um, you know, I think we could use observational data a lot more. And one thing that we could do pretty easily is if you've got observational data, one thing that the RCT community might like is if you try to use it to design better RCTs, right? Mm. So like if you can say things like, well, you know, RCTs are good because they can help to really determine what is causing what and what mechanisms work to, you know, but you could have like different kinds of models of the world in mind and different kinds of mechanisms that could be at play. And in particular, there's this literature on Bayesian networks, which is, you can think of these essentially as like graphs or graphical models as well. So there's this, sorry to be a little bit, there's a lot to explain to try no, to no, no. Go for it. describe this idea. So graphical models, as they're an alternative way of looking at the world, you'll often hear of like directed acyclic graphs, etc. Nobody uses them per se in mainstream economics. And I think that's actually, in some respects, fine, because there is some work that sort of shows that graphical models are equivalent to the more like Heckman style structural models and Rubin's potential outcomes framework, which most of economics is based in Rubin's potential outcomes framework these days. Mm. And that these things are all kind of equivalent to one another in that a theorem in one is a theorem in another. Um, and they're just um, emphasizing different things. Well, one thing that graphical models are good at emphasizing is that you can have all sorts of different, you know, graphs, as it were. You could have um, some things causing some other things in different ways and different relationships between different things. And if you're doing an RCT, presumably you want to be able to say something at the end of the day, you know, to put it in terms of the graphical models uh, approach to say something like, um, you know, this is the graph and this is, these are the mechanisms. But one thing that the graphical models approach sort of gets at is that there can be situations in which if you really trust the graph, if you really trust the model of the way the work the world works, you can use observational data to get things that look a lot like causality from just correlations. Mm. And it's using the structure of the graph, those that's essentially your assumptions. That that's the structure that is added mm. so that you can, you know, seemingly get causality from correlation when normally as we know correlation is not causality so one what, thing that i think would you believe the could, results from something like that well i could in some situations you know i think it's very few situations but i have encountered one or two times 
um, a situation where somebody was wanting to do an impact evaluation. I was like, well, why don't you just look at the probabilities and update according to Bayes' rule? And you would get something that was so close to causal, like it would be actually very credible as a causal estimate. Mm. Um, So the example that Pearl likes to talk about um, and some others have written about is, you know, suppose you're looking at the effect of smoking on lung cancer. And historically, I guess, you know, tobacco companies like to argue that there was some third unmodeled factor that was both leading to people smoking and leading to lung cancer. Like, I don't know what this third factor is. Health, Health neglect in general. Yeah, yeah. So like, but if you knew that there was some other factor between smoking and lung cancer, like for example, tar in people's lungs that you could measure, then you could um, just look at the population prevalence of each of these little bits. So like, what is the probability of um, cancer given tar in lungs, tar in lungs given smoking, and sort of string all these things together and compare them with just the probability of having cancer in the population and get Mm. something that looks pretty convincing. So I, you know, I think if you're interested in this, Michael Nielsen has a nice blog post that I actually uh, gave some of my students um, at ANU to look at, uh, because I think it's a very good description of um, Mm -hmm. how these kinds of models work. And one thing to get back to what I, you know, initially got me down this route is to say something like, well, look, one thing somebody should do is to try to look at how we could use uh, Bayesian networks to say something about, well, yeah, but what kinds of graphs are more likely than other graphs given the observational data? Because, you know, the observational data, you can try to infer what kinds of graphs are more likely than other graphs. And if you've got, like, if you can nar- narrow down the set of possible, like, ways in which the world works to, like, a couple of competing options, then that's something that you can test pretty easily between with RCTs. But, like, why don't we at least use observational data to, you know, lower down the options, as it were, before you know, Mm. use the big guns like (laughs) RCTs where it's like really necessary to, but if there's some other smaller problems where we don't need to, then great. That's really interesting. Uh, Yeah. We should definitely get that link and, and, and put it put it in the blog post attached to the to the show because I'm very interested to learn more about that. Uh, but it's not something I know very much about. Yeah, no, happy to share. Is this is this kind of a new a new fashion or a, a new new interest in among statisticians? I don't think so, to be honest. I think it's actually really unfortunate. I do wish that there was more attention paid to observational data. Yeah. Another another approach that people have suggested, uh, and and Lant Pritchett has been pushing really hard lately, is to, to stop stop looking at just like rigorous evidence that that we can really pin down and instead go for, for for really big hits that admittedly we might not have such strong evidence for but but they have you know higher expected value so he, he was writing a lot about this last year and he wrote this article uh, for the Center for global development called the perils of partial attribution uh, and, and he finished it with this with this paragraph uh, in a very strange terms, terms of events uh, the organizations and supporters of the wildly successful team de- team development are under pressure to sacrifice actions that can produce trillions in gains in the economy in education in health through systematic transformation and instead development actors are being pressured to do only actions for which rig- rigorous evidence proves what works but that leads inevitably uh, to a focus on individualized actions known to produce at best mere millions but for which the donors and external development actors can take direct cause of credit but there are real changes from the perils of partial attribution in which individual actors care more about what they can take credit for than what there is in the collective team success so I think you know, he's basically saying there that there's things that we could do where we'd never really know who caused the outcome that would be a lot more valuable than you know just scaling up things that have that are proven to work where everyone knows who caused what. Do you yeah do you have any views on 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 that on that general issue? Um so I guess I would also relate it to like this idea of like yeah larger um interventions that are perhaps hard to study versus um you know in some regards I mean lots of people have said well you know Concurrent with the rise of RCTs is also this rise of a, on a focus on very, on you know smaller questions as it were that are more attractable. Mm. Yeah. Um, but to some extent, I'm actually quite sympathetic to the smaller issues just because it's really hard to know what's going on with the large ones, and it's entirely possible that you know we are leaving things on the table by not sort of focusing on the big ideas. Mm. Honestly, I don't know. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess, I guess it, that's the issue is that because you can't measure <laughs> the effect of these other things, <laughs> exactly. it's, it's very hard to... I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, you're being a good empiricist. Well, I guess I suppose he's saying that one way that he thinks people are biased against this kind of big picture hits based giving in development is that kind of the credit is spread too thin. And so each person kind of discounts their impact on, on the outcome. And, and so and so they underweight how valuable they've been because because they can never really demonstrate that they de- they definitely had an impact. And, and I, I guess, you know, if we set up bureaucracies or we set up aid agencies the right way, then they're not going to care that much about their impact on, you know, policy reform because they'll never be able to prove to a satisfactory standard that it was they who caused the outcome, uh, which, which could lead to a lot of neglect of some important questions. Yeah, could you imagine that? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm not sure what is the right way of thinking about this problem because... It seems like it would depend a lot on how the policymakers, um, and I keep on saying policymakers, some people don't like that term, so bureaucrats, whatever you want, institutions mm. <laughs> that the bureaucrats <laughs> happen to be nested within. Yeah. Um, it kind of depends a lot on how they're making these decisions in the end and um, what they're caring about. Because, I mean, in some regards, I think a stronger factor in terms of what they fund is just that they don't tend to like it's actually relatively few people still today I think who care about evidence and who care about impact evaluation results and you know I think actually I wouldn't be terribly concerned that you know there are all these policymakers who they really just care about the <laughs> impact found in an impact evaluation because actually I think if anything probably too few people do um, and you know people may be getting more of their guidance from oh they happen to have you know a best friend friend from high school who tells them that this <laughs> is the best thing to do and you know now they're minister of finance or minister of whatever and they can do what they want yeah. <laughs> um, so like I would worry more about those kinds of things rather mm. than I mean, just as a first order consideration, but to be honest, again, I I don't really know. I wouldn't consider myself an expert in this topic. So yeah. those are my priors, but, you know, <laughs> aggregate them with some other priors. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Okay, so let's move on to talking a bit about, about your career. We, we should do a full episode at some point about economics PhDs, but, but I just had a few questions. So you finished your career, I guess, uh, you, sorry, your, your PhD. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was premature. You, you finished your PhD uh, about two years ago, and, and then you, you applied to a whole lot of different places. And if I recall, when you were writing your, your PhD, you're a little bit nervous about uh, where you would end up landing, but you ended up get, getting a whole bunch of good offers. What, what's the process by which economics PhD grads actually, actually, actually get their jobs? Sure. Um, so I'll slightly correct you and say that like I had actually done my PhD a little bit earlier, but then uh, the thing is I didn't go in the academic job market. Mm-hmm. Um, I got kind of like an early offer at the World Bank. So, you know, I was finishing up at Berkeley. I was in my fourth year. I got the offer. I said, oh, thank you very much. I mean, nobody goes out in their fourth year on the job market. Mm-hmm. So um, that was a bit too early for the academic job market, but I said, thank you very much for this job. I'll take it. And then when I was at the World Bank, I was like, oh, actually, you know, I think I would prefer to be in academia so then I did a postdoc mm-hmm. and then I went from the postdoc a couple of years ago um, on the job market but uh, yeah the PhD process to get a job um, and I actually this was quite similar from the postdoc because um, you know I didn't do the postdoc too too late so in fact there was uh, still a couple of people from my original cohort at Berkeley who were going on the job market at that time and Uh, I think it would be different uh, for more senior markets, but if you're still on the junior market and you're going through the normal process, there's a very centralized market in that... It's kind of communist, really. (laughs) (laughs) It's very strange. Like Uh, Almost all the first round interviews are done at this one annual meeting. So... You go to these meetings and you do your first round interviews and basically everybody is there, like all um, all sorts of schools from all over the world, not just U.S. schools. And you do some short interviews there um, over the course of just a few days. Then you do second round sort of fly outs at the different schools that, you know, invite you to a second round. And then out of those, you know, some share of those also uh, make you an offer. So that's the general process. It's, like I say, highly centralized, and uh, it's also a little bit of a crapshoot, <laughs> um, yeah. I'm sorry to say, like, because there's a lot of uh, heterogeneity and lots of things that just randomly happen, and, like, the more t- 
times that I observe it, the more times I see like really weird random stuff happening. Like, you know, as much as economists like to believe in efficient markets and as nice as this process is relative to some other disciplines where they've got a lot more hoops to jump through, it is a little bit strange in that, yeah, these... uh, there is a lot of just random noise that also enters in. Mm. So, so it, sounds, it sounds pretty stressful because of the randomness. Um, I mean, how did, how did you manage to do well? I guess, was it just, just luck as well? Or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, I mean, there's there's not much that you can do at that point, I believe. Like, you know, you try to have the best job market paper you possibly can, but... I mean, and then the only other thing you can really do is, you know, apply to a lot of places, hopefully get good letters from people. But a lot of this is things that like most people in grad school are not going to know very much about, right? Like if you're a grad student, do you really know if people can write you a good letter or not? Like how do you really know that kind of thing? And it's also somewhat hard to necessarily figure out while you're still in grad school really what constitutes, you know, a really good job market paper. And you know, is it's it, tough. So, is it something that you can that you can game while you're while you're doing a PhD? To, you know, get get academics to like you and and write about you. Yeah, no, I think that is fair. And you know, I've I've <laughs> to be perfectly frank, have occasionally observed. Um, I mean, I think there's a little bit of a trade off too, because like I think sometimes the things that help you get ahead are not necessarily the things that are uh, useful or important questions. And so on the (laughs) rare occasion, I've seen somebody who's been very cynical, who has entirely played to what they thought was a hot topic and, you know, been rewarded for that and, you know, good for them for that. But, and that doesn't always even work out necessarily. So, I mean, I'm not trying to say that that's like a straightforward way of uh, doing well either, because you can end up working on a hot but unimportant topic and nobody likes you in the end anyway. So, you know, I think... I, have you ever compromised your career to do research that was that was more <laughs> valuable than otherwise? And, and do you think that went well or do you regret it? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I think there are some... I think that if I were... Um, Strictly speaking, trying to uh, have the absolute best career possible, I probably would not have chosen the topics that I've chosen to work on. Um, So I've probably gone a little bit far along that direction, but I'm actually perfectly happy with that. Um, I'm, you know, quite proud of the topics I've taken on um, and wouldn't really have it any other way. I, Mm. I remember one time I was talking with somebody who, uh, you know, specifically was saying like. You know, they thought that I would have done better on the job market if I had had a more conventional paper. Mm. And this was somebody who had done quite well for themselves. Um, <laughs> and, no, but in a very, you know, not in a not in a kind of gaming way, I don't think. But, mm. you know, they'd done quite well for themselves. But I was just thinking to myself, you know, actually, I'm kind of proud with what I did in a way that, like, I would actually prefer to have my life than their life in some regards. So, you know, yeah. I'm obviously being, you know, purposely vague here on uh, some of the details. <laughs> but, you know, there are trade-offs to be made, I think. And it's not that – I don't want to be too, too cynical. I think that academics do, in fact, reward – um, important work. It's just that they also reward a lot of other stuff too. <laughs> so no doubt. Um, yeah. So we often recommend an economics PhD to you know smart students who have good good quant skills because it just opens up so many options after they graduate. Do, do you think the path is kind of overrated or underrated now? So it's hard to say because what is true is that I think people end up with an inflated view always routinely of how things are going to go for them. So it's tough because I think if people have in mind that, you know, they're going to do in the top of their class and get, you know, a great academic placement, you know, they're probably wrong, (laughs) Um, almost certainly wrong. And in fact, you know, a lot of the placements that you see on web pages, those are also even sort of like the upper bound because they don't Mm. take into consideration that like a lot of people fail to get tenure and go to other places afterwards and may leave some people off the website entirely, Mm. et cetera, et cetera. So like there's all sorts of biases in the process. The other thing is that a lot of people when thinking whether grad school might be right for them are thinking with the framework in mind of, oh, well, I've done really well in classes so far, and so therefore I'm going to do really well. But they, they don't take into consideration is that, A, everybody else has also done very well in classes so far, and um, B, it's kind of a different skill set, actually, to do good research than to do well in classes. Mm. I think, you know, there's actually 
quite a lot more work that goes into doing good research than most people realize. Mm -hmm. Now, the other side is that actually I really love my life. <laughs> I think it's fantastic and I'm very happy with everything pretty much at this particular moment. But at the same time, it is quite a lot harder than I think people think. Yeah, so. well, I mean, how high is the bar for, for getting into a good economics PhD program? Oh, so the bar for that is already very high. And then out of that, there's, you know, even higher bar depending on what you want to do afterwards. I mean, if you're not interested in academia, but want to do other things, well, PhD can also help for other things, I suppose. But most people who want to do it, do it because they want to go into academia, I guess. In fact, if you don't want to go into academia, don't tell anybody because they're less likely to want to advise you. <laughs> That's mm. the general advice that's given. But, um, you know, I'm not sure where exactly the line is right right now. But I remember just to give some kind of background. Um, certainly when I was at Berkeley, there was like... There was some time that I was helping with, so the grad students could help with admissions, um, but in a very limited way. Like basically the ones that didn't meet some cutoff thresholds were thrown into like a pit that grad students would sift <laughs> through, you know, to try to pull out some, uh, you know, scavenge some gems from, you know, the losers in the pile. Yeah, this sounds um, grim. Yeah, I know. And Berkeley was one of the better schools, I think, for that. Like, mm -hmm. I think a lot of other schools, if, you know, you don't meet the cutoff, then there's no sort of recourse. There's no grad students looking over trying to, you know, mm -hmm. find uh, you again. Is there any kind of clear indication that you can get uh, of whether, like, your, your math skills are, are up to the task? Not super clear, mm -hmm. but I mean, so... Certainly, you should at least look at like the quantitative score that you get on the GRE. And if it's mm. not like either perfect or like, you know, really close to perfect, then, you know, Reconsider. no matter whether or not you're cut off out for it, like you might perfectly well be cut out for it, but nobody will accept you. So mm. uh, <laughs> um, the other thing is, you know, obviously, the better you are at math, the better your time you'll have at it, particularly yeah. because I think economists are frankly um, biased towards uh, uh, you know research that involves a lot of math even when it's not necessarily <laughs> yeah. so so the very top tier schools are, are, very, are very selective but is there much point going to a, to a second tier school and I'm thinking especially if, if you don't want to become an academic you instead want to go and work at the World Bank or you know some other organization that can make a difference or go into policy uh, is, is that still a good option so I think if you're interested in going into policy etc there's especially some good schools around DC that are good for that that have a lot of interactions with um, you know the World Bank etc so like you know University of Maryland etc like the schools around there that are maybe like you know not considered to be top economic schools, but are mm. fairly well integrated into, you know, the policy world that can still actually help. Mm. Okay, well, I look forward to doing a, to doing a full episode on this topic uh, at, at some point in the future, um, may, maybe maybe with you. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> but as a, as it's one of our kind of top paths, uh, I think I think I think we need some more content on it. Of course, we have we have the career review uh, on this topic, which which I'll link to. Um, so people can take a look at it if, if they're considering uh, doing an economics PhD like you did. I've got to let you go, but I guess just, just one, one final question. What's the strangest or like most ironic thing that you found in your research over, over the last five or ten years? Is, is there anything that's made <laughs> um, you laugh? So one thing that is kind of ironic is, um, especially with some of my earlier work, having looked at you know how much context really matters. And some of the pushback I got at the time was, from people saying, yeah, but we know that already. We know context matters and um, that results wouldn't otherwise generalize. And in some of my more recent work um, that I've done with these discrete choice experiments, um, you know, where we gave people the option to choose which of two studies they thought was going to be more informative. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did that with policymakers, but we also did that with researchers. And a little bit contrary to what you might think, given how, you know, researchers said they cared so much about context, they didn't seem to in these discrete choice experiments. <laughs> so I would say, you know, there's, you know, not to pick on policymakers, there's something probably to be learned on both sides there, um, yeah. you know. It's easy so. to see uh, other people's mistakes than your own, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> My guest today has been Eva Vavout. Thanks for coming on the 80,000 Hours Podcast, Eva. Thank you. Remember that if you're listening all the way to the end of an episode like this, you're exactly the sort of person who should check out our job board at 80,000hours.org slash job hyphen board. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.